Good afternoon um, or good morning to our audience uh, to and welcome to all of you who signed up for the MedTech Europe webinar Introduction to Loink. We're glad that so many of you sh uh, showed up. Um, this um, shows that the that the topic um, hits a nerve and um, and um, there's great interest in the MedTech industry and beyond in Loink. This is a webinar um, from MedTech Europe, um, Introduction to Loink. Um, I'm going to forward now and see whether we can, here we go. Um, uh, the agenda here is, um, and I'm gonna quickly advance this here. My name is Michael Strugan. I'm Director of Digital Health at Metric Europe. Um, we have as um, a second speaker, uh, Sabine Dörhöfer, who is um, the Vice Chair of, Metric, of the Metric Europe Interoperability Working Group. Um, she will talk about Loink and the Metric industry. Um, the LOINC overview will be delivered by Swapna Abiyanka, who is Interim Director of LOINC and the Health Data Standards at Reagan Street Institute. And finally, we're glad to um, also welcome as speaker, um, Professor Sylvia Thun from the Charité University Hospital, who's going to talk about and add some observations about LOINC in Europe. Uh, Quickly, a, a, a few um, practicalities here. All attendees are muted by default. Uh, if you uh, want to make a comment or ask questions during the presentations, please use the chat function. We're going to monitor that carefully. Before and during the Q&A, please ask your questions using the chat uh, function or in exceptional circumstances, we may unmute you if you raise your hand. Um, this session will be is already being recorded and the recording and the slide deck will be made available to you. In fact, you can already download um, or you should be able to download um, the slide deck um, in PDF because we already uploaded it as a handout. Um, quick uh, introduction to Medtech Europe. We are the European Trade Association for the medical technology industry, including diagnostics, medical devices and digital health. Obviously, LOINC is very relevant for the diagnostics industry, and we'll talk uh, about um, the relevance um, for that industry in a few moments. Um, quick overview about the medtech industry in Europe. For those who are not familiar, this is a 115 euro billion, billion euro market. We have about 675,000 employees, um, our member companies and um, member and companies in the medtech industry. Uh, they deliver more than 50,000 in vitro diagnostic tests, deliver more than 500,000 medical devices. We count about 27,000 uh, medtech companies in Europe, of which 95% are SMEs. And we are one of the most innovative um, uh, industry, industry sectors in Europe. Uh, a word about interoperability and medtech Europe. Um, as many of you know, the lack of interoperability is seen as a critical barrier for digital health deployment. We've seen in recent years a growing momentum for buyers and authorities to recommend or adopt standards. Um, Metec Europe founded the Interoperability Working Group in, at the end of 2018, early 19. It depends on how you count. And we published an interoperability position paper and a call for action where we outlined um, and articulated the METIC um, position, industry position um, in July 2019. Um, you're welcome to download this from our website. The current focus of the Interoperability Working Group in the Digital Health Department is on engaging with stakeholders, training, and education. And on that note, I would like to hand over now to Sabine Dörhöfer, who um, is the METIC Europe Interoperability Working Group Vice Chair and also works um, in her free time for Roche Diagnostics. Um, Sabine, floor is yours. Or the other way around. Many thanks, Michael, <laughs> for the introduction. <laughs> My name is, is Sabine and in Wuthering Roche, I'm working in the Global Standardization Program. And what I have learned there brought me to a strong belief for external standards, such as LOINC, for efficient and fast data transmission. Let me share with you why we are doing this educational webinar. 
Um, the idea came alongside the work on an interoperability consolidation white paper within the interoperability working group about the standards. And we said, hey, does everyone know as much as we know, how much can we share? And this is the idea to have this educational webinar here for you, our audience. And for the intro, let me just share a few thoughts on the importance of lawing for the medtech industry. The COVID-19 pandemic situation clearly showed the importance of health data interoperability and the data communication in a common language. For example, in a coding system such as LOINC, each health system and clinic has its own method to categorize and describe health observations such as lab tests, lab reporting, result reporting and clinical documents. And it's very, very difficult for the system to exchange information with all these different methods. So in times of crisis, as the COVID-19 pandemic we are right now in, having complete data on testing is really crucial to understand the situation and informing public health decisions. And furthermore, the access to standardized structured data is fundamental to any future healthcare informatics strategy and a must-have to support our clients out in the field in the lab for pandemic statistics and research. So let's learn together more about LOINC from Swapna Abiyanka, who is today with us and many thanks Swapna for joining us and your willingness to share your knowledge. Excellent. Well thank you very much for having me. Um, so I just, I appreciate it. And I hope this is the first in a series of uh, webinars. Let's see if I can advance. Um, there we go. Okay. So I'll be giving an overview of, uh, of LOINC and I'm planning to cover a lot of information. Um, sorry to advance. I don't know if there's a lag. I might have to turn off my video if, uh, if there's a lag in the slide advancing. Um, so, sorry, uh, you know what, hang on one second. Yeah, we're still seeing your opening slide. I gave you control swap now. Um, here we yes. go. Yes, okay, great. Um, okay, so just a quick uh, slide with disclosures about funding sources. And so, you know, we have two primary sets of funding sources. One is the core funding, which mainly is uh, US government and then the Reagan Street Foundation. And then we also have uh, some secondary funding for small projects that we've done with various different groups that you can see on the slide. Um, so basically a quick um, overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, so just a uh, you know, quick run through the history, uh, the Lloyd concept model, um, how we create content and, you know, publication, um, basically mapping to LOINC, just some quick tips on that, and then overview of our uh, work with COVID, um, a little bit about education and communication, and then we're actually going to be doing Q&A um, at the end. Um, so we can, uh, we can just go directly to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Toon, after mine. Um, so, and I apologize, I'm not sure. Michael, you might have to just advance the slides because I think there's a delay. I'll be happy to do so. Okay, uh, let's thank see. you. Okay, perfect. Um, so LOINC was originated in uh, 1994 by Dr. Clem McDonald, who is an internist, and he was working at you know a hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he saw this problem where he would be getting lab results from different patients from different hospitals and there was no way to aggregate that data because everybody was using different coding. And so he looked around, didn't see that there was a standard that already existed. And so he decided to create one. And so first he created the LOINC committee and then he began developing LOINC. And um, he started with lab observations in 1994 and then quickly moved into clinical observations just a couple of years later. Next. So LOINC is maintained by uh, the LOINC team, which is at Reagan Street Institute in Indianapolis. And Reagan Street works as the SDO for LOINC. Uh, we have several LOINC committees that provide oversight and guidance 
and originally there's just the, you know one Lloyd committee, but that has split into uh, the lab committee, the clinical committee, which has a few subcommittees, um, and then we have a separate one for um, our work in radiology. So the Loink Radlex committee is a separate uh, committee under the Loink committee umbrella, and then we have a very large international user community that participates in every aspect of you know of Loink creation and publication and maintenance um, and, you know, and uh, adoption. Uh, next. So LOINC is currently used in over 170 countries and almost 30 actually have some mandate uh, in use for the use of LOINC, uh, primarily in the lab space, but also in other areas as well. Um, we have nearly 100,000 registered users now for our website and search LOINC. And currently we have uh, 20 linguistic variants for 12 languages. Um, and most of these are for LOINC terms, but we also do have some translations of user's guide and um, you know, some other resources. And these are all done by volunteers. And you know, obviously there's a lot more than uh, 12 languages <laughs> in the world. So if you are interested in translating LOINC or want more information, then I just, I have the links um, in the slides. And so sh you should be able to go directly to them from the PDF as well. Next. So the scope of LOINC, uh, like I said, it started in the lab space and has, you know, grown uh, quite a bit over the last 26 years now. Um, and so we mainly have four types of terms. There's lab LOINC, which most people are familiar with, clinical LOINC, which includes all sorts of measurements, um, you know, body weight, vital signs, uh, measurements on x-ray or EKG. Um, this, Third type of uh, term is called HIPAA attachments, which I'm not going to talk about because that's directly, uh, or that's only relevant to essentially insurance uh, and payers in the US. And then we have a whole um, area on the standardized survey instruments. And that's one area that's really been growing, you know, over the past 10 years or so. And, you know, we started with uh, term one, and now we have, I think, about 95,000 terms and we keep growing. Uh, next slide, please. And so the types of lab tests, you know, people usually think of routine lab testing, um, but there's many different types. So there's, you know, inpatient and outpatient. There's home testing, which is becoming more common. Uh, specialized lab testing. We have, you know, a whole um, content domain dedicated to newborn screening, a uh, large number of veterinary terms. And then of course, you know, public health and epidemiology, which is sort of underlined by the COVID crisis. Uh, next, please. Um, so like I mentioned before, the clinical terms um, include all different types of measurements, and they also include um, clinical notes and reports, including, you know, for radiology procedures, um, ophthalmology procedures, ophthalmology measurements, um, basically anything that can be measured but is not a lab essentially falls into type 2 like terms. Next, please. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, survey terms is our fastest growing area currently. And so these include both patient reported outcomes as well as uh, measures that are completed or you know, observed by providers. Um, and basically we have a structure for LOINC panels um, that's used in you know, all four class types. And in lab, it's mainly used for batteries of tests like a CBC where you have a group of tests that are done together but in the survey space, the panel structure really has evolved and we've added you know, a lot of different attributes, including you know, skip logic and override display names and specialized answer lists and things that are only found in um, you know, these types of assessments. Uh, next, please. And next, so the LOINC terms, you'll hear me say you know, LOINC term, LOINC code, LOINC concept. But really, the term is the code plus one of the LOINC names. And so I just have an example of this uh, SARS coronavirus 2 RNA term. And you can see the code is 94500-6. And then the name that is shown on the slide is the long common name. But we actually have several different names. So you know, a term is basically the code. And then any of the long common name, short name, display name, um, or fully specified name. Uh, next, please. 
So the code itself is a unique and permanent code and there's nothing really special about it except we sign them in order. And so you can actually tell based on the code itself when the term might have been created. Um, as I mentioned, oops, as I mentioned previously, the um, we are up to about 95,000, but you know, if you actually advance to the next slide, I think there's just one animation in my slides. We actually have code 1-8 and the number after the dash is just the tech check digit, but you know, we still publish code one. And so people are often surprised when they see uh, codes that are not with the seven digits that they expect with the five plus the dash plus the check digit. And so, um, you know, and I say, well, we start at one and uh, expect to need one more digit pretty soon because I think we're gonna be to 100,000 before we know it. Uh, next, please. And so each LOINC concept or LOINC term is defined by six parts. And, uh, you know, there's many other things that also go into the LOINC term, but really when you're looking at the definition, it's these six things. So the component is what is being measured. The property is the dimension of the analyte. So, you know, essentially, is it the mass concentration? Is it a length? Is it a pressure? Uh, the property will tell you that. Uh, the time aspect essentially tells you, is it measured at a moment in time or over a period of time, such as a 24-hour urine where the urine is collected for 24 hours and then the analyte is measured in that sample. So those terms would have a time aspect of 24 hours. Um, system is the name for the type of sample or specimen. Um, the scale is a more general um, representation of what the property is. So there's just a handful of scales we have you know, quantitative, ordinal, nominal, and uh, document, um, and narrative actually. And then the method, so the method is interesting because this is the one axis that doesn't necessarily have to be populated for a long term. So the other five have to have values. The method is optional essentially. And in general, we only include a method if the way something is measured affects, um, you know, its clinical significance. Uh, next, please. And so you can see from this slide, um, basically we use the same parts. And so there's you know, LP codes that you may have seen um, because each part uh, actually has its own code as well, but we put together the different parts in various ways to make unique terms. And so the first two rows, you can see you know, sodium, substance concentration, PT at just point in time, and QN for quantitative, those are all exactly the same. But in the first term, we have urine as the system. In the second one, it's CSF. And those two are you know, very different concepts, obviously. And then the second example, uh, that's from the clinical space. So a similar example where, you know, if you just looked at the first couple of columns, body weight, mass, point in time, you would think, oh, these are the same term. But really, they're quite different because the first one represents the patient body weight. And the second one represents the body weight is, you know, estimated uh, from an obstetric ultrasound for the fetus. Um, and the reason that the system is hacked fetus is because the result is actually going into the mother's uh, health record, but we have to represent in some way that it's the fetal measurement. And so this is how we do that in blank. Uh, next, please. Um, and so, like I mentioned, the six parts define a given term, but there's many, many other attributes that are associated with each term. And if you could actually go to the next slide, I just have some examples. Um, and so we have, you know, units of measure and formulas for some quantitative terms. We have the type, which is the one, two, three, and four that I'd mentioned before. Uh, we have classes, which are basically just a way to organize the terms, um, you know, in, Sometimes we'll update the class if something was placed in the incorrect class or um, if it makes more sense that it belongs to another class. But you'll notice some of these um, attributes may change from release to release. And because they're not the core defining attributes, um, you know, it doesn't change the definition of the term. Uh, we have the status, we have whether a term represents an order, an observation, or both. And so panel terms are all order codes. And then individual terms like hemoglobin or cholesterol, those could be either an order or an observation. So they have the value of both in that field. Uh, next, please. Um, and then here are some more attributes primarily related to uh, the type for the survey area. So we can uh, go ahead and uh, go to the next one. 
Um, and then this one is important because a lot of times, you know, people want to know, well, what were the terms that were released in just in the last, last release? Or when was the last time this term was updated? And so we have information about that in the version last changed and the change type column. And there's more details about all of this in the like user's guide. So if you have questions, um, you know, definitely use that as a resource. And then we have a ton of descriptions. So we have descriptions both at the part level as well as at the term level. And that's because, um, as I showed on the slide, you know, a few slides ago, we reuse the parts. And so if we have a description for the part sodium, you know, it, it makes sense for the analyte, but then sometimes we might have a different description for the significance of sodium in uh, urine versus sodium in um, CSF. And so, you know, when there's that type of distinction, then we would add the description to the term level. Uh, next, please. And so all of the attributes are listed on the details page. So if you're interested in a particular LOINC, you know, you can go to loink.org slash and then just put in the LOINC number. Or, and this actually works for the part numbers and the group numbers and the answer lists as well. Um, and it will pull up these details pages, which will give you all of that information, uh, but in a much more readable format. Um, and so these, you know, all of these attributes are available for viewing, but they're actually also available for searching, um, as I'll show a couple slides down the road. Uh, next, please. And then just a quick slide on relationships to other terminologies. So, you know, we've been working with many different groups um, in terms of um, linking to outside resources. And, and the long-term goal is to create more of an ontology, a formal ontology in LOINC, but this is kind of like a stepping stone to that. And so, um, you can see we have linkages both at the term level and the part level, and these are actually available in our download files as well as from our fire uh, distribution as well. Uh, next, please. All right, and then next. So the term creation process. Um, so, you know, nearly all of our content is, um, is driven by user requests. So, you know, it's very rare that we will go out and find a concept and say, hey, you know, I think we need a new long term. That actually happened when uh, the pandemic first started. So, you know, it, in the middle of January, we were, you know, sort of monitoring what was happening in the world. And uh, one of our content developers, um, Jamie, she said, oh, I think we need to talk to the CDC about developing, you know, some terms to test for SARS-CoV-2. And so in that case, we actually reached out to uh, US CDC to start that process. But in general, you know, in most cases, people send requests to us and then we go from there. Um, our submission queue is publicly visible. And so that's a nice way to kind of check to see if the concept that you are interested in, if it's not already created, if it's in the queue, so you don't have to resubmit it. And we have a pretty rigorous process. So we have, you know, the initial intake, we have uh, some pre-QA processing, then the submission goes through a QA review. Uh, there's more processing after that. Then we build the panels and add answer lists and add descriptions. Um, and then finally send, you know, the term report to the submitter. And then twice a year in June and December, we have our public release when the logs are included in that actual uh, final distribution. Uh, next, please. And so there's several different ways to request new terms. Uh, one is through Relma, which is our desktop uh, mapping application. Uh, we also have several spreadsheet templates and then an online submission form as well. And if you go to link.org slash submission slash new terms, you'll find information about all of these different methods. Uh, next, please. So maintenance of Link also relies heavily on the user community uh, because, you know, Sometimes we find out about changes in nomenclature, different changes in scientific knowledge, and we'll update terms. But oftentimes it's users who, you know, who will send us a message and say, oh, you know, this nomenclature has changed, or, you know, what was this term meant to represent? It's ambiguous, and then we'll do some research and make uh, updates as necessary. Um, we only update an individual term if the edit doesn't change the meaning of the term. But if it was created incorrectly or for some reason is no longer recommended, then instead of updating it, we actually change the status to deprecated or discouraged and we'll map to either an existing term uh, that's more appropriate or create a new term 
and map to that one. And those, you know, map uh, maps are available in the map two table in the distribution. Next, please. So as I mentioned, you know, we have twice yearly distributions of LOINC. Um, we have the downloads, which are CSV files. We also have RAMA, and then many, many accessory files. I think we're approaching maybe 15 or so at this point. Uh, we have the online search application, which is also, up, you know, the content is updated twice a year. And at this point, we're actually working on a huge redesign of that application and planning to introduce it at the uh, fall conference in a few weeks. And so just stay tuned for that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have um, the fire terminology services, which are currently, you know, still in beta status, but there's a ton of information out there about that if you go to loink.org slash fire. And then we have the pre-release page that has all the new terms created uh, between the cycles. Uh, next, please. All right, so um, switching gears just a little bit uh, and talking about, you know, basically coding and uh, vendor coding and who should be responsible for coding. Um, basically, you know, I think the consensus is that the closer the coding is done to the source of the data, the better it is because it's more accurate and the better it is for interoperability as well as patient care. And the creators of the data really have the most information. And so, you know, in the case of lab tests, um, it's really the IBD vendors that are the best suited for identifying the appropriate load code because they know all the details about the test. And so we've been working with, uh, you know, vendors for several years on um, you know, assigning one codes at the source, because the idea is that if you assign it, you know, if the result comes out of the machine with a one code, then you're going to prevent, you know, errors downstream from every hospital system and, you know, lab and health information exchange and researchers, you know, everybody downstream who's using that result, if they already have the one code attached to it, then that will make the data uh, much more clean, basically. Uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to mention a little bit about the LIVID format. So that's LIVID stands for LOINC for IVD, and it was created by the IVD Industry Connectivity Consortium, uh, basically as a standard format for vendors to publish their catalogs and uh, LOINC mappings, basically associated, uh, you know, for each of their results. And the LIVID format includes um, a spreadsheet as well as a JSON format as well. And there are many vendors that currently are providing their test catalogs in this format. And I think, you know, as vendors, more and more vendors start making these publicly available, um, there will be much, you know, much more increase in uh, interoperability, reduced effort in terms of choosing the correct long term downstream. And I think, you know, it will be a tremendous boost for labs as well as, you know, everybody else downstream as well. Uh, next, please. So just a couple of slides on uh, mapping principles and uh, search syntax. So the two key principles to keep in mind when you're trying to choose uh, the correct link term is to choose the most specific term based on the information that's available, but not to over-specify. So for example, you know, if your test is a 24-hour urine sodium mass concentration, then you should choose the term that's you know, for 24-hour urine um, and not just choose the point in time term. However, on the other hand, if you don't know if you know it's a 24 hour urine or not, then you don't wanna choose the more specific code because you really have no idea if that's what's being tested. Um, so those are the main principles about choosing the code, but then in terms of searching, we have, you know, uh, there's a very uh, powerful search syntax that's available both within Realma and SearchLink, and that's available in uh, the help that I have a link to there. And there's many, many operators, uh, but I just have the key ones that are listed there. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. And so I just have you know, two examples. The first one um, shows how taking advantage of all of the information that you have available about the test itself will get you to results uh, much more efficiently. And so again, if you have a glucose you know, 24 hour urine reported as a mass concentration, you know, we get a very common complaint. You know, why are there a thousand glucose codes? Well, because there's, you know, there's many, many different types of glucose codes, but if you, you know, every test is quite specific. And so if you just look for glucose, you're going to get a thousand results. If you look for glucose and urine, that's better, but you still have a hundred. 
Uh, but the more information you add, you can see that, you know, you get more and more specific. And if you know that grams per deciliter um, basically translates to mass concentration, then you'll get the one term. And I realize that's a little bit tricky and our new search syntax will be, or not new search syntax, sorry, our new search link will have uh, the capability to, to sort of um, do that by filters and, you know, many choices that'll make it much more easy. Uh, next slide, please. So the second point about searching is, you know, not only include all the information from your local test, but also take advantage of all those different attributes that I showed you, you know, many slides ago. So, you know, you can say component colon, and then, you know, is it um, sodium or cholesterol or whatever. In this particular example, um, it's sort of an interesting example because uh, the word LEAD can mean, mean both the chemical lead as well as an EKG lead. And so, you know, we often get emails from people saying, well, I searched for lead and, you know, why did I get EKG terms? Well, it's because, you know, that word is also used in, um, in terms that are about EKG measurements. And so if you look, you know, if you sort of look for lead or lead, you'll get, you know, 400 results. If you narrow it down by looking for uh, lead or lead in the component, you'll still get 300 results. But then if your particular test is looking for tissue lead level, then you can narrow down actually quite quickly and, you know, get down to one term just by putting in lead, tissue, and uh, mass content. And as I mentioned, the new search application is going to make this a lot easier um, just by, you know, having uh, like many choices on the left side and just allowing people to narrow down um, what they need much more quickly without having to know the advanced search syntax. Uh, next, please. So just a quick, um, oh, sorry. So yeah, so maintenance of mapping. So this is re very important because I think oftentimes, um, you know, users will map to like terms and then essentially not look at them again and just sort of assume that the mappings are correct. But blank changes over time and test catalogs change over time. And so really, um, you know, these mappings have to be maintained. Um, and so, Basically, we recommend that 90 days after um, the publication of a new link release that um, uh, that you update your catalog to the latest release. Um, and we have many different ways of actually filtering down, you know, if you're trying to figure out which of the tests you're using have, you know, changes in the link terms, there's actually very easy ways to figure that out. Um, and so you can find information about that in our, you know, search syntax as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, so a quick overview of the SARS-CoV-2 work. Um, I just have a few slides on this. So, you know, we've been working nonstop basically since January um, on creating terminology related to uh, both the lab testing aspect as well as case reporting and clinical care aspect as well. And, um, you know, this is a, an area in which almost every term we've created, we've worked with somebody other than just one single submitter um, on creating these concepts to make sure they're modeled correctly. And we have about 200 new terms that span lab, clinical care, and public health reporting. Uh, next, please. And so we have two, you know, dedicated web pages that we've uh, stood up related to SARS-CoV-2. One includes information for how to choose, uh, you know, the correct link code and other FAQs uh, related to SARS-CoV-2 testing. And then the other one is actually a list of all of the current published and unreleased or pre-released link codes for the various aspects of, uh, you know, the terms related to COVID-19. So we have separate tables for lab and case reporting and um, ask and order entry type questions and clinical documents. And as we create new terms, uh, these pages get updated basically on a daily basis. Uh, next, please. And then the key resource that I wanted to point out is this livid file. And so, you know, I mentioned the livid file before, and it was originally created as a resource to, um, so that manufacturers or vendors could provide a single format for their test catalog and their link mappings. Um, but here, basically, we've been working with uh, several stakeholders to create 
this file that goes across manufacturers and across, uh, you know, across vendors. And basically, we're including every single test that's approved in the U.S. by the FDA. Um, but that set includes, you know, many, many um, tests that are developed and produced by international manufacturers. And there's several hundred rows in this table now. And basically, you know, if you go to this, uh, if, if you go to the link, you'll get a file that has every test, uh, the LOINC result code, the LOINC order code, uh, SOMED CT codes for the specimens and the qualitative results. And, you know, more recently, a lot of information has been added also about uh, device identifiers and, um, you know, things like that. And so it's just, it's a huge uh, resource that I encourage you to look at. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then this is just some information about groups. And so I'm not really going to talk about this, but if you're interested in uh, LOIC groups or value sets, then I would encourage you to look at the information we have on our uh, FIRE page, which again is loink.org slash FIRE. And next, please. All right, so just a uh, final few slides. So um, in terms of education, you know, resources where you can get more information, we have a new LOINC knowledge base that we launched in June, and that basically is uh, has created a um, a resource for things that were only previously available as PDFs, like the LOINC user guide or the Realma user guide, and now they're searchable um, and part of the knowledge base. And we have uh, several other uh, things that are in there as well, and we are adding to it over time. And then I wanted to give a special mention to these guides for using uh, LOINC terms for various domains. And so some of you, I believe on the call, were involved with the microbiology guide that was published a couple of years ago in terms of reviewing um, and or pilot testing. And we actually have seven more guides that are in the works. And so if you're interested in you know, looking at them or participating um, in being a pilot site or a reviewer, just go to loink.org slash guides. Uh, next, please. And then other resources, I mentioned this, you know, search syntax card. Um, at in-person events, we give out this, you know, it's, I think it's like a five by seven card that has all of this uh, great search syntax on there. Um, if you'd like a PDF of that, just, you can contact us. Uh, but there's many different ways to contact us. And the main, you know, the main way is to go to link.org slash contact, and you will get a menu of choices depending on what your question is. Uh, next, please. Um, and so I think this is the last slide. So we have twice yearly conferences uh, before COVID. The idea was that we would have one in the U.S. in the spring and one outside the U.S. in the fall. Um, and now, you know, that's uh, gone upside down a little bit, but, you know, we're still planning to hold virtual conferences for the time being. And these conferences include both committee meetings, uh, which are free and open to anybody who wants to attend as well as educational workshops that are presented both by our team as well as by people from the user community. And so the next conference is actually coming up just in a few weeks. It'll be fully virtual. Um, as I mentioned, committee meetings are free. And so if you're interested in the discussion there, um, you still have to register, but then you, know, you can attend. Um, and then the education workshops and presentations do have a small fee um, and you can see the early bird ends in two days. Um, but if you register, then we, you know, we provide you with all of the recordings for all sessions um, after the event. And then we're actually having a special promotion for members of MedTech Europe. And so one educational session, which we haven't exactly figured out which one it will be yet, uh, but that session will be made available at no charge and the details will be announced shortly. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I have the slide, but I think we're going to go straight to the next uh, presentation. And Michael, you were surprised, but <laughs> I got through them in my half an hour, right? <laughs> we made we made really good time. And now, um, if there was now a, a load of um, a, a number of attendees uh, interested in asking questions, I would now open the floor. But so far, nobody really has raised their hand or indicated anything in the comments. Um, this is your chance to get in touch with Swapna, but. I think in the interest of time and um, also because um, our following speaker has quite a few um, additional items to add that may be of interest, I think we'd go, we'll go straight to Sylvia Toon, 
um, from the Charité University Hospital in Berlin. And I'll keep uh, running uh, uh, being your slide master. And I apologize for sometimes not exactly getting it right or for some delays here. This is this is a platform I'm getting getting used to as well. But um, over to you, Sylvia. Please unmute yourself and the um, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Michael. So uh, my name is Sylvia, I'm from the Charity uh, in Berlin and I'm a physician and uh, I'm responsible for digital medicine and interoperability and uh, we have several projects in Germany going on and one of um, that is the uh, LOINC implementation and LOINC implementation in Europe is slow but very sustainable. Um, projects and products with the loins are slowly emerging and uh, we have um, first translations are done and as you all know we have 24 official languages in Europe so you can see some of uh, I, uh, I think seven translations uh, of seven language translations and um, the cooperation with the Regenstrief Institute is extremely, extremely good here um, while we are doing these translations. And in addition to the translations, however, the content of the countries, such as specific patient related outcome questionnaires, need to be included. And I would highlight to you Austria, because they implemented loan codes in the ELGA, that's the EHR for years and um, they have included laboratory values and vital signs and um, many other codes or concepts. LOINC and UCOM um, is available in Germany since 2007. It's um, like a, a small, um, um, uh, um, I, I met Clem McDonald at the working group meeting, at the HL7 working group meeting in 2007 and there we discussed about how we can um, support uh, LOINC implementation in Europe and we decided that we will have a mirror in Germany for the whole uh, LOINC um, specification. So uh, we made the translations afterwards but just some about uh, uh, 10,000 translations and we provided the translation to the Regenstrief Institute, but unfortunately, the software industry has not adapted the standard in Germany. So next slide. So beside that, we have Europe. <laughs> and so there was a project that was called EPSOS, European Patient Smart Open Ser Services. And uh, we, um, um, we specified the International Patient Summary together with SEN and ISO and HR7, IHE here. And um, there's a cross-border directive um, that stipulates that the electronic health record should be used in Europe based on the IPS. And within the IPS, we created the master value set catalog. And there are loan codes used for several areas like vital signs, lab results, and sections and document types. So meanwhile, next slide, and there's a law in Germany that is called Patient Data Protection Act. It is very new. And within this um, law, it says that we have to provide terminologies and um, um, they say it should be SNOMED and LOING for our German electronic health record. It's not here yet. We don't have the specification, but it should be implemented in 2021. Uh, this makes the introduction of LOING mandatory. Besides that, there are other um, projects going on. Um, they are called uh, medical information objects. Um, and here we do have a medication plan or a immunization plan, and they provide lawing uh, for our software vendors. So uh, beside that, next slide, last one. There are um, large projects going on, which require the use of lawing in research. And here I um, introduce to you the Medical Informatics Initiative from our Ministry of Science. 
um, that requires lawings, uh, lawing codes and SNOMED codes for our so-called core data set. And this core data set um, includes basic models and extensions. And here I am, for instance, responsible for the pathology um, report and the omics, um, the genetic testing report. So um, on, 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 the, on the other hand, uh, we created the so-called German Corona component or consensus data set. And uh, within this data set, we use all these long terms that you were talking about before uh, within our specification and all university hospitals have to use these codes and the data set that is based on FHIR and LOWING, SNOMED and ICD-10 and IDMP. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sylvia. I think you've, um, uh, your, your contribution made a nice close, in a sense, the the um, the circle that I started at the beginning when I um, uh, made the observation that a number of European um, governments and uh, payers are adopting standards and um, I think the German government now making LOINC mandatory for uh, for the time and starting in 2021 um, I think is, is a nice illustration of that so this means that um, all players including the medtech industry uh, should really familiarize themselves with LOINC, um, engage with LOINC, and uh, hopefully adopt uh, uh, LOINC in daily practice. Um, I still would like to now, well, I would like to now open this up for question and answers. Um, uh, I'm almost afraid that we may have a technical hiccup here because um, it can't be that nobody in the audience, and we have about um, a little bit more than 50 people in the in the in the auditorium um the virtual auditorium that nobody has a question nobody would like to ask any questions this is your chance uh to engage with the panelists either with um sabine from from roche diagnostics our vice chair of, of the interoperability working group or swapna of course who gave you um, a broad overview of um, LOINC and how to engage how to use LOINC codes how to contribute to the community or Sylvia adding her observations from the German um, from the German practice. Uh, are there any questions? Would you like to ask each other any questions that we would like to do? We because um, all of us have been really um, good at sticking to our timings, and so we have a few minutes extra. But we can also, of course, close this and and go home early. Um, uh, would you like to um, ask each other any questions? Sabine, any, any observations on, uh, on Swapna's presentation? Or Sylvia, have you learned anything new uh, from Swapna or anybody else? Uh, and uh, we now can confirm that indeed the chat is working because we are indeed um, uh, chatting now amongst um, uh, the panelists. But I think I've not heard from, from anybody from the audience. I think if this is uh, the end of it, then I would like to perhaps um, uh, close this uh, this, um, oh, this webinar. Michael, I'm early. sorry. Yes, Can go I ahead. interrupt for one second? So I just got a message from one of my team members that there's no clear way to ask a question on their end. Um, um, so if you if you uh, if you use the chat, and I think we don't we didn't. Uh, let me see whether there is anybody. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We have a number of chats. I am so sorry. <laughs> we seem to have overlooked the chat window here. Um, so I have here a couple of of, of chats. Um, uh, let me see whether we can whether we can uh, uh, whether I can identify this. So um, we now have um, uh, so Caroline Schechterle. Let's start with you. How can IVD manufacturers participate in the livid format? Do they have to sign in? Let's start with Caroline here. Uh, Swapna, can you respond to that? Sure, no, so the Livid format is free to use by any manufacturers. Um, and so you just have to go to the uh, IICC website, and I have the links again in my PDF, but it's just, you know, there's information about how to use the format and about the two different, the JSON and the Excel spreadsheet. 
uh, format as well. And so uh, it's open to use. And actually, because of you know everything that's been happening with COVID and the extra attention that's been paid to the Livid format, um, they're actually in the process of um, you know, working on it and adding to it as well. And so if you have input from that side of things, um, I would encourage you to get in touch with the IICC through uh, their, you know, means of communication. Excellent. Then I have a question from Antje Plaschke Schüttelflitter. Um, which companies do already provide LOINC codes in their product catalog? Um, so there are many, I guess. I. Do you think it's okay if I mention specific uh, uh, vendors? I think I I think I see no reason why not. Okay, um, so you know many of the big manufacturers, including uh, Biomiro, Biomiro, and uh, BD, and Roche, and Abbott. Um, I believe um, Siemens is also publishing some link codes. Um, and there are, you know, I think there's many other ones as well, but those are the sort of the big ones that I know about at the moment. Okay. I think that addresses the question. I don't think um, uh, we violated any confidential information. Okay. I think all of this is public, <laughs> so that's good. Dr. Suda Kodati is asking, what are our thoughts about the future in a mixed ecosystem of coding standards and solving the broader interoperability problem for the patient? Do we have a mixed ecosystem? Obviously, Swapna, you must think that um, Loink um, does it all. Why would we need what? other? <laughs> okay, <laughs> other no, no, okay. So no, not at all. I agree. Like I think we definitely need to, you know, solve the problem. And part of the issue is that there are many different terminologies um, and coding systems, especially you know globally, that you know different countries are using different coding systems. And that's part of the reason why we've started down the road of you know connecting up to these other terminologies. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to make that process easier, but I think it's still extremely challenging. So I don't, you know, I certainly don't have a solution at this point, but I think at Link we clearly recognize that we, you know, we have our area, um, but we need to work with other SDOs in order to, uh, you know, promote interoperability. And, and there's a worldwide community, and this is called a Joint Initiative Council, JIC, and they try to uh, connect each other, uh, like DICOM and uh, ISO, Loink, Snowmade, uh, to each other. And um, we do have a strategic plan here concerning the ecosystem of yeah, technologies and working together. Okay. Um, I have another question from Gavi Bauer, and, and I see some of us, uh, some of the people in the audience have several questions. So I'll try to at least address one of your questions um, uh, individually, and then we'll see how we get, how far we get. Uh, Gavi Bauer is asking, where in the communication chain from IVD device to final patient report is LOINC mandatory? This could be something for Swapna or maybe for Sylvia to, to understand, uh, to, to discuss, because I think the term mandatory, I think, was introduced by by Sylvia and by me, of course. Um, but Sylvia knows this much better than I do. Yeah, it's mandatory uh, within our specification. So we have an implementation guide, a fire implement implementation guide for special use cases and so-called plans or lists here in Germany, like the medication list. And if you want to provide the medication list or the immunization plan. You have to provide it with the correct long terms for the document for the section and so it, it's more or less implicit mandatory thank you i think that addresses the question um uh in france um uh, uh one of our colleagues is is, is chiming in Javier, um, uh, the, um, it is mandatory from the lab to the national electronic health record so this may in fact actually be indeed a, a national um, dimension, because as we all know in uh, Europe, particularly the use of, of, of uh, healthcare is national, healthcare is a member state responsibility. So those types of um, specifications are really different from member state to member state. Um, I have Ali Aziz here. Um, can, uh, can, adopt, can LOIC be adopted to existing laboratory information management systems? 
Sh sure, we just did it uh, at charity. Okay. So Ali, um, one of uh, you may want to get in touch with um, with one of uh, some of our panelists here, or join the Loin community. I think Sylvia is also a speaker at the Loin conference that uh, Swapna mentioned in October. Let me see whether I've missed anybody here. Uh, Jay Cola, um, I'm not sure this is a question, but I'll read it out anyway. Uh, Jay used to lead the UK pathology standards program until recently. In the UK, we do not use LOINC, but of course the challenges you highlight about LOINC and adoption are interesting. Without getting into politics, I would say that enriching the, quote, ontology in LOINC would also help to map harmonize it with other coding systems like SNOMED CT and NPU, which is used in Scandinavia. Um, not sure this is a, a question. Um, would any one of you like to add your observations to that? Um, so this is Swapna. I'd just like to say I completely agree. And I also do want to point out that, um, you know, so Reagan Streif and Snowmite International have had, um, or, you know, have a cooperative agreement, but we haven't actually done very much work under that in several years, but we are moving forward. And so if, you know, for, you know, places that are using Snowmed and would like to see more uh, work done between Reagan Streif and Snowmed on, you know, Snowmed and Link, um, that is coming soon. Excellent. Any other questions? I think we're getting, uh, we have four minutes left until the full hour, but I think uh, we may have exhausted us um, or the, the attention span of, of our colleagues. Um, I think we've already highlighted ways to engage with you in future. Um, we will make this uh, recording and uh, the slide deck um, available to all of you who signed up and who attended in person. Um, uh, Swapna mentioned the LOINC conference in October. Um, LOINC is a welcoming community, um, so we, they, they love and welcoming new members, so uh, please feel free to engage. Some of your colleagues may already be um, engaged in LOINC, um, so we are very happy also at Metec Europe here to um, close any loops if that is helpful. We will continue working with you, Swapna, and with LOINC um, and, and uh, make the case um, for standards adoption driven by our interoperability working group. Um, I want to close with um, thanking all of the speakers here, Sylvia particularly, who um, opened the, who um, I think is, is uh, uh, presenting from her vacation, so um, this, is, this is very much appreciated. Sabine, of course, um, who as vice chair, this is part of your responsibilities, but we welcome you, we, we thank you anyway, and particularly, and of course, and above all, Swapna, who's given us quite a bit of your time. I know this is a busy, busy time for you. You're preparing your annual, your, 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 bio, your, 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 your online conference. And so the team has been really, really busy. We very much appreciate that you took out time to, um, to bring the LOINC message uh, uh, closer to us. And we very much appreciate this. With this, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us um, and uh, would like to uh, yeah, send a virtual round of applause and uh, close this webinar and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.